Britain's police are supposed to be above politics, yet The Economist describes them as the poor, bloody infantry of the government's campaign to restructure the coal industry. Was it a political choice not to use the civil courts under the government's new employment laws? Two weeks ago on this programme, we put this question to Lord Denning. I think that it must have been a matter of high policy, at least ministerial and maybe even cabinet level, not to go to the courts of law, but instead to call out hundreds and thousands of police. Tonight, our reporter Barbara Evans presents the case for the miners that the police have been playing a political role in the strike. The question you should ask is, are we trying to ensure the freedom of people who have done nothing wrong and are acting strictly according to the law, wanting to go into work? And that's what we're trying to do. Now, if you want to support the freedom of people who are trying to prevent those people going into work, you're not supporting freedom. You're supporting anarchy and violence and riot and damage and everything else. You're asking the wrong question. No doubts for Britain's senior police chief. His job, as he sees it, is to help miners go to work. It's been a massive operation, keeping pickets out of Nottinghamshire and enabling a few small groups of miners to get into work in Yorkshire. If you see it as a political confrontation, you might think the police were siding with the government. I give you this pledge. The police have received the government's total support. They will continue to do so. The policing of this year's miners' strike is unlike any strike before. It's the end of a chain of events that started at the Saltley Coke Depot during the miners' strike of 1972. Flying pickets had arrived in thousands to stop the coke being taken out. To avoid a violent confrontation, the local chief constable shut the gates. It kept the peace, but it led to victory for the miners, the three-day week, and humiliation for the Heath government. There's no doubt that uh, uh, ever since then, the Conservative Party have been anxious never to allow this to happen. So in the present situation, the pressure on the police not to allow it to happen is quite great. After Sortley, Whitehall reorganised its emergency planning system. A new secret civil contingencies unit was set up in the Cabinet Office to keep a close watch on all key industries. Planning for the present miners' strike has been going on since 1981. It's been... ...actual moving coal from the pit heads to the power stations, use the private hauliers. And this again is very obvious and sensible, because the Royal Corps of Transport are exceedingly well trained and disciplined, but they're not very numerous, and there's a great many private hauliers around the place, and in a time of recession with not enough work. Crucial to this plan has been a centrally coordinated police force. On the 13th floor of New Scotland Yard is the National Reporting Centre. Set up in the wake of the Saltley Gates incident, the centre has transformed policing in Britain. The boards show where riot-trained police support units are deployed in the coalfields. Picketing activity is monitored round the clock and a daily report sent to the Home Secretary. Chief constables are supposed to be independent, but their part in policing this dispute has been planned from here. Right, I'll show that. The court commitments so is the NRC the operations centre? It's run by the president of the Association of Chief Police Officers. No, it isn't. No, it isn't. It isn't an operations centre in any form. Because an operational matter is when you are telling police officers what to do and the National Reporting Centre doesn't do that. In fact, chief constables would be extremely annoyed if there was any attempt by the National Reporting Centre to try to tell them what to do. John Alderson has worked with the NRC and he disagrees. Well, he will tell them because the Home Secretary has got power under the Police Act of 1964 to make one chief constable send his resources to another to make a police authority uh, agree to the resources going from one area to another. So that sort of latent power of the Home Secretary to uh, back up all this is, is, is important. It's important to remember that. So that in effect, uh, you have a de facto national police force operating. 
In theory, local police forces, like the one in South Yorkshire, are responsible to police committees. But the NRC has put a stop to that. Up to the 13th of March, we had our normal full con consultation with the chief constable. But as you're aware, the uh, National Reporting Centre uh, was uh, brought into being on the 13th of March. And from that day onwards, uh, we've had no consultation, uh, only information passed on to us. I believe that the chief constables of this country have surrendered their operational independence to the National Reporting Centre. In other words, the creation of a, a paramilitary uh, state police. This Home Office report followed the 1981 inner city riots. Within a tighter organisation, the stress was now on riot training. It led to the introduction of NATO helmets, lighter shields, reinforced riot vans, CS gas and plastic bullets for every force, and training in what are called positive tactics. It has meant a transformation in British policing. You have to compromise less if you're more powerful and strong. And if you're seeking to keep the peace uh, by negotiation, then you, you, your style is different from if you're trying to keep the peace by repression. As soon as the strike started, the revamped police machine swung into action. The National Reporting Centre was activated and roadblocks were set up to stop the movement of pickets around the country. It was an unprecedented move. As this amateur film shows, thousands of miners were stopped and told to turn back on the grounds that they were going to cause a breach of the peace. Can have a name and address of your passengers, please? Uh, I'll start it from that gentleman there. Can have your name and address, please, sir? Jared Even though picketing is not a criminal offence, many were arrested for trying to picket across the county border. Aye. No, I just said, right, I'm going down the road, I'm, I'm, I'm going into Nottinghamshire. You're not going to turn around, you'll be arrested. Why? Because we've reason to believe that you're going picketing. Okay, we may be going picketing, but is picketing a crime? Uh, well, no. Well, therefore, why can't I go forward then? Well, well, is secondary picketing, well, is secondary picketing a crime? Well, no. Well, why can't I go forward then? And then, uh, and then somebody will, uh, another one will come along and say, I'll deal with this. Look, turn round, or you're going to be lifted. Now, what liberties have you got? Now, that roadblock policy has meant that people haven't been able to get into Nottinghamshire. Police will say that means that offences haven't been committed. But equally, it's stopped trade unionists from attempting to peacefully persuade other trade unionists to join their dispute. Not only at the pits, but at power stations, coal suppliers. They've physically isolated a county. We have almost the equivalent of pass laws. You have to prove you're not a minor to get into Nottinghamshire. And you then have people being arrested for nothing other than refusing to turn round when a police officer tells them to do so. Now, the police cannot point to any act of parliament that gives them the right to do this. They're relying on what they call their power under common law to prevent breaches of the peace. The effect of the mass arrests went further. Blanket bail conditions imposed by the courts kept huge numbers away from picket lines. These were handed out to no fewer than 95% of miners brought to court. Copies had been mass produced and stapled to the charge sheets. There's box upon box upon box of these bail conditions just being waited to be pinned to these sheets. They must be done in thousands, ready for anyone who is arrested, give him one of these. That's to restrict the picket line in order to allow people who are scabbing to go into into work. Yeah, you accept it, you see, don't you? I mean, you accept it when you're in court. court in. You get your bail, you go out and so on. They're going to stop me going picketing. But then you think about it, you think, well, when somebody uh, when somebody gets uh, charged with shoplifting and then gets remanded for reports, why don't you get bail conditions? Not allowed to go in any shop in Britain. You know, I mean, it's only, it's forced him, it's that obvious. Mrs. It's plain as nose on your face that it's only happening to us. Picketing is not a criminal offence, and this bail condition is tantamount to an injunction that an employer might be able to get if he went to a civil court, but really stops something like now 6,000 men taking any form of legitimate action 
to protect their jobs, to help other people all the time they're on bail. And they may be on bail for three to six months. With Nottinghamshire safely working, we began to hear about a drift back to work. You have to bear in mind, you see, that the National Coal Board and indeed the government uh, have pinned their faith uh, on uh, beating the other side, if I might put it that way, by a drift back to work, hoping that those miners who wish to go to work would drift back. And of course they see the organisation of pickets as a means of stopping that. Equally, of course, they see it as important that the police should guarantee the rights of people to go back to work in order that they may attract more. And if more and more people felt that they could go back to work without uh, incurring the wrath of their fellow strikers, that they would. And therefore, the role of the police becomes critical to that political purpose. No comments. Every morning, thousands of police with horses, dogs and riot gear turn out to ensure the passage of a handful of working miners. The daily ritual has drawn attention to the strike breakers. Without it, there would have been no public appearance of a drift back to work. But the first duty of the police is to keep the peace, not to help workers get past the pickets. They could have decided, as they did at Saltley, that the best way to keep the peace was to deter attempts to cross picket lines. The commitment of vast police resources to a policy designed to break the strike has been a political choice. The charade of getting a working miner through a, a long line of pickets backed up by thousands of policemen is incredible. It must cost something like 200 or even 300,000 pounds to get a, a couple of working miners in. And what happens? They can't go down the pit because it hasn't been opened off. Uh, as we term it, it hasn't been declared safe by uh, NACODs because they're on strike and they're not going through the pickets. And so consequently we use all that money to take a couple of working miners through their right to go to work and what's happening? They're sitting down in an easy chair in some office somewhere and going to sleep for the rest of the shift. Despite the massive police operation, the drift back to work never really took off. The strike hasn't crumbled. But in the course of policing it, something else has happened. For the first time, we have seen the police having to resort to some kind of paramilitary-style policing, which we've always associated with continental police forces and always prided ourselves on having avoided having to introduce. Britain now has an 11,000-strong riot-trained police force. Their job is far from easy, but their behaviour has shocked and frightened many miners. More than 7,000 miners have been arrested. Most of them have never been in trouble before. The police have helped the government, but at the cost of their political neutrality. And I had three policemen come up to me and say, you shouldn't bring your children into this environment. And I said, we already live in it. And he said, well, how can you expect your children to respect the police? And I said to them that when they see that the fathers and the brothers were being run down by police on horseback with truncheons and also in riot gear, they won't respect the police. Couldn't believe it. 56 years of age, respected the police all my life, brought my sons up to believe in ask a policeman and all that kind of jargon. Never anymore, never anymore in my life will I respect a policeman.